Hello and welcome to DIY Indie Musicians Talking Music. Today, I'm really honored to have uh, Joe Adamar as my guest. How's it going, Joe? Good, thanks. Yeah, um, thanks for having me on. Appreciate oh no, it. listen, it's a real, it's a real pleasure. Um, I I had a great chance over the last few days to really explore your your large and prolific um, output of songs under your own name but also the, the second project that you have, uh, which we'll get to in a bit, because I think that we're really going to bond on that because I think we have a lot of shared musical interests and influences. Um, but yeah, so, so let's talk about it. First, under Joe Adamar, you've released, what, a number, two or three singles this year, and I know you've got an album that's coming out. So why don't we start by talking about that a little bit and giving you a chance to plug your stuff. Um, yeah, so I released uh, an EP uh, about three months ago, uh, and on it were three tracks, which will be on the next album that, that comes out on July the 12th, um, Bandcamp only, um, which, you know, you and I discussed before um, we started recording. There's, there's a lot to to gain from, from keeping it but Bandcamp exclusive, because the people that are generally invested in your music tend to hang out there. And uh, so it won't be going on the streams till December. Um, now this album, um, it's my pinned tweet at the moment. Um, I, I took advice from uh, the, the page that they have on Bandcamp called uh, Advice for Artists. Uh, and it said, if you'd like us to review this, then give us at least eight weeks notice. So I, I gave them 10 and um, wrote a little message just explaining exactly what the album was all about. and. It was about three days later, um, the director of editorial, um, a bloke called Joseph something, he, he emailed me back just saying, I, I've just listened to it and we're going to feature it a few days after it's released. So wow. hopefully hopefully about six days after the 12th, so around about the 18th, they say that it might it'll appear around about lunchtime, Eastern Seaboard time, um, and it will hang around there for a, a day or two as one of the new and notable, I think they call it. So whenever you fire up the app or you uh, visit the homepage, there'll be those albums that they, they're recommending for that day. Wow. Yeah. So so it isn't it isn't just only their family and friends then? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, that's, that's <laughs> previous. Band band. No, no, great. Yeah. No, that, that really congratulations over that. That's a really big kudo. You know. Yeah, it's it's a, it's an album that that is sort of a watershed for me because I you know I've I've had four albums out in the last sort of two and a half years and and they've been a sort of a st steady progression of production value, which I'm sure you'll uh, appreciate. It's something that's always you're always getting better. Um, yeah. I'm kind of I wouldn't say I'm embarrassed about my first two, but certainly the the mixing and the mastering that I did for them sort of underplays their their um their power, and then it, I sort of get get with the picture a little bit on the third and the fourth the fourth is still my favorite but then this one came along and, and i i there was two things that were different about this album um the first thing was i gave myself a really nice birthday present which was the entire collection of synths um by arturia and um what they do uh they they do the software versions of all the great classic 70s 80s and 90s synthesizers mm -hmm. and um so I've got everything from, you know, the Jupiter 6, the A, the ARP, anything that, you know, Vangelis w was using. Um, and it, it sort of opens up your palette to such an extent that I ended up writing quite a lot of the album based around these synths. Um, and that, I think there was an untapped sort of electronica thing uh, deep inside me that I hadn't really itched hard enough. And I did. And I mean, there's probably about three or four that are very electronica mm -hmm. and, the, and the other thing was was my voice um um so i sing on all my amble albums and as soon as i get up above baritone it is i don't seem to have a tone to my voice that i would call a lead singer's tone so i can sing in tune yeah. and we have a few few tricks that we can make our voice sound a little bit better but i i've never really thought of my voice as being something that, that um is a lead singer's voice but i stayed low um that was the thing with this album and when you stay low and you quiet and you lean into the mic and you and you record all your breaths 
you can get a sort of an intimate lead vocal that um it was a bit of a eureka moment really so mm -hmm. the combination of those two things uh you know a, some decent songs that um you know it's more minimalist arguably uh and that seemed to tickle whoever at bang camp makes these decisions so it's 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 one of the most um exciting things that's ever happened to me is actually be featured on the on the bang camp um new yeah. and notable page like like i said that it's really good exposure and hopefully it'll find you a, a bunch of new fans which would be fantastic but 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 it's Absolutely. it's interesting the point you were making about the minimalism because it's something i've been thinking of, about a lot lately and um, we were discussing a little bit sort of pre-show is that i think that especially when you start out there's a real impulse to have more and more and more tracks um to the point that that things start getting very busy and mm -hmm. i i think that it's one thing I, I'm finding because I'm I'm working on a an album that I'm hoping to release by the end of the summer, and I one of the things I'm really focusing on now is, is stripping back, <laughs> you know, yeah. Because yeah. I, I think it's sometimes during the compositional process, it's it it's necessary, uh, you know. But but I think that it, I think the problem is is that we all listen to our own stuff too much, by necessity. Because you have to listen very carefully, very critically. And I think that you get so used to listening to something some way that you don't, you completely lose sight of a first time listener's experience, if that makes any sense. No, it does. Yeah. You should, you should treat every song as though it's a first listen and write it accordingly, you know. Um, yeah. In fact, that was something that, that Tom Robinson talked about. Um, when he was sort of describing the other day this is the guy that does the six music um uh, introducing site he said that you, it when you submit to his um introducing thing you to treat it like an audition and and i would i would expand that advice and i'd say that every song you should you should always peak the interest early on because what you don't want people is skipping in this digital age uh, so yeah i couldn't agree more there martin yeah yeah no it, it's it, it's 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 funny in that way so so let's let's talk about the whole Bandcamp thing a little bit because I after after hearing from you when we were sort of setting things up about what you were planning, I went to the website and I started checking it out, and it, it mm. actually sounds fantastic. And I, I'm hoping that a lot of artists start sort of following the strategy you have for this new release. Um, in in that. Um, I, I, I wasn't familiar with it, but it seems as if what Bandcamp has done is they've just stolen a lot of what's really good about a platform like Indiegogo and have integrated it within Bandcamp so that you can, they'll do all the back end so that you can actually produce uh, LPs, tapes, or CDs. I think it's all three, right? That they'll, that they'll do. They can, although I, I am using my own. Um, I'm using a guy in in the UK to mm -hmm. to do mine. Um, but yes, yeah. I, I have I have seen that if you can get pre orders that equal that minimum amount, they will then manufacture it for you. So yeah. it, it, it's very good. I didn't go for that in the end. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, yeah. I think it's a wonderful because it's it's a really low risk strategy in a sense. Uh, and and the other you know and the other thing is that it's only going to cost you what mastering and I think like the, the setup costs for the printing or something like that. So it's likely to just be a couple hundred dollars, you know, max. Really? Yeah. So, and then, yeah. Oh, I see. I didn't. I uh, yeah. Yeah. And ba yeah. Basically, yeah. if I understood it correctly, uh, basically, and I, I should try to see if I can find someone from Bandcamp to get on to explain it because I think it would be mm. very useful for a lot of musicians. But from my mm. understanding, it's like, you have to, you, you launch the project. There's mm -hmm. a minimum, I think it's 250 committed sales that you need to get. And at that yeah. point, you have to produce the goods so that they can produce it. And then okay. they'll do all the fulfillment. They do everything. So mm -hmm. you, you, you don't have the risk of having 10 boxes, like 10 crates of records that you have to store in your house. Mm -hmm. You don't have mm -hmm. to go and make the postmaster your best friend. By going to the mm -hmm. post office to deliver things and you don't have all those hassles um yeah mm -hmm. you know and i think that that that's great and the other thing that they did that they took because i i've been watching the sort of development of 
of Indiegogo, especially with comic book artists and how they approach it. And what they yeah. all what, what Bandcamps also seem to have done is they've taken the best of that so that you can you can set up your campaign with different levels. So someone can spend, say, let's let's say it's five pounds for 10 pounds for a record. Um, for 15 pounds, they can get stickers and a poster and whatever. For 25 pounds, they can get a signed copy, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So you can have different mm -hmm. goals. You can have stretch goals, I think is what they call them. Okay. Um, and that's really good too, because let's face it, I think the people that are going to probably want and buy the physical stuff are mostly collectors. And, mm -hmm. and I think the way that they work it with, with Bandcamp too, it's a, it's a money total that your goal is, not necessarily a numbers goal. So if you sell more of the higher value stuff, you can reach your goal more quickly. Mm. And then once it's there online, it, it's sellable for the next whatever, as long as bank camps around, right? Because they'll produce more if they're, you know, if they're selling them, obviously. Well, as long as bank camp is around, I think the, the world for DIY musicians is a lot better place because I've yeah. got a lot of time for them. They're, they're a, 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 the last basket of ethics within our, our industry as far as i can see for getting your your songs out there yeah i love them yeah. a lot they're great yeah. yeah so but 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 tell me then let's talk about the other part of the band camp strategy as well because you were you were saying that you're planning on releasing a couple of singles and sort of leading up to part two which is release on on um on streaming services so so what what made you think of doing it that way I, I did it with the last the last album. Um, okay. So I, 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 you know, I'm not claiming to be a particularly followed um, artist, to be honest. You know, I think my monthly listeners have just dipped below 250. So, and my and my band camp followers, I would argue that the half of the 75 I've got are probably people who are just doing follow backs. But mm -hmm. the 35 to 40 people that um, are invested in my work, um, if they buy it on band camp. I don't think it's fair for me to stick it on Spotify um, because they've invested in me. And that, that's a loyalty that, as an artist, um, I think deserves reward. Uh, I hate to use that expression, but so to consequently, um, my release for Spotify um, will be five, six months later. Um, and, you know, that will just have to be but when you when you talk about a couple of single releases yes i've already submitted the album so it's sat there on all the servers all these different streamers um ready for me to to promote one of them and i can just pick two singles which i know exactly when and uh, i will do that um probably a couple of months maybe a month after the band camp release and then a couple of months after that and then finally just before christmas um the album will come out in the streams um, so that that's my technique it's it it's not a technique but it's it's a just a, a reflection of my loyalty to to the few people hopefully with the the band camp feature i might pick up a few more followers and mm. um and it, it, and you know i feel more vindicated for making that decision yeah well I, I wouldn't i wouldn't undersell yourself though I, because i think it's a it's a very smart marketing strategy as well and to be quite honest with you i think i'm probably going to steal it for my album uh no because I, I like i like the fact i think that it finds a good balance between the let's say the rapacious desire of the streaming services for new material right new singles uh you mm -hmm. know and 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 the need to really have something new out every few months mm -hmm. Um, and the fact that you can actually be loyal to your fan base. And quite frankly, you know, the, the 30 or 40 or 50 or hopefully hundreds of sales you're going to get uh, over Bandcamp is going to be much more lucrative <laughs> as well, you know. And yeah, might, I mean, might, pay for some, might pay for some of the hobby costs that we have, right? <laughs> well, it, yeah. I mean, I, I, the one thing I, I don't, I'm not kidding myself. You know, it, it, it's still a hobby that, that yeah. earns us pocket money. And that I think everybody... You know, should we you should never fail to forget that we're we're, oh. we're artists, but we're we're kind of playing the game as it were. Yeah. But um, to go back to your your point, um, I think um, 
that that Bandcamp um, is is just uh, some people overuse it. The, the, the one I think there are, there are certain artists that I've engaged in a follow back on Bandcamp, and they seem to use their email messaging service as though it's Twitter, <laughs> and it's kind of like. Oh great! I've got another one from so and so, and I, I think we, you know, it would if people learn to maybe use it a bit more sparingly, just for releases or just to say I've I've got a new one coming up in a in a month or something. Um, it would be better used. Um, but yeah, the the Spotify release thing. I think there's an enormous number of our peers that they write something good and then they and we've I've done it. You know, they act on impulse. And they bang it straight out, you know, with two or three weeks notice, so that they can put a little bit of a plug in, so that it, it will appear on people's release radars. And that's it. And and I know that's that is the streaming way of doing things. It's just have a constant stream of new singles. But I I have just don't want to I don't do that. <laughs> I write albums. I like to think of them as a body of work. I like to think that the that the, the fans that are again engage with me will listen to it from start to finish and yes I, I can appear and maybe in the odd playlist if i release a single every month but it doesn't really fulfill the the sort of musical integrity that i seek from yeah. from my art yeah it, you no, know, yeah, i'm, that, that I'm sounding sense. a little bit of my ass there but you know that's how i feel no, about no, it that, that, and listen, yeah. that's perfectly valid although what, what mm. i what i'd say as well uh and this is an experience i've had you know with like let's say buying a, a truly classic album years after it's become famous, uh, it's inter it's all it's always interested me to hear all the hits, and I'm talking like something like Rumors by Fleetwood Mac as an example, right? Where they literally have five legitimate top five singles on the record, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then all the other tracks are good. It's it's interesting for me to listen to the concept of the album within the context of knowing all these hits. So you're familiar with some of the material, but it's how do they work together? And when you, you can mm -hmm. see that and how successful you realize, wow, that's why it's such a successful album. So, so both are valid. And that, that's one of the things I like, and especially like with my, my new album, you know, sort of, sort of tooting my own horn, I think there's legitimately five or six singles on it. So, so it's fine. I mean, I like the idea of a slow burn. I like the idea of, of for the people who are interested in it to have the ability to go and hear the rest of it early, right? And hopefully buy it. Mm -hmm. um, and and I like I like that you you know it's that you can feed the, the the streaming service in a in a way that makes sense because I think the one problem with releasing albums or EPs is one song sort of gets all the buzz and then everything else gets forgotten. Mm. So, yeah. you know, and, and this, yeah, I think, yeah. would help, you know, alleviate that. Yeah, I, look, I mean, you know that, that I do a lot of pr production remixing for people and, and quite often these releases uh, from other artists, I, you know, um, I watch them at work because I'll get tagged into every tweet and um i i really i they do it in it with so much endeavor i mean i i just released something with uh mikey j who you know just a couple of comments that i made on his youtube video and before i knew it i had his his guitar and mandolin stems anyway to cut a long story short <laughs> i think i think a weekend about six weeks ago i just threw them into to logic and wrote a kind of a new song around it very simple yeah. with a yeah. couple of chords um and then then mikey went to work and i watched him <laughs> on twitter and it was just like i'd look at my phone i'd be like oh my god it's like i've got 77 notifications here what's going on and um and that was because mikey he he is totally clued up uh, uh about getting people to save pre-save you know and then he then he's he's working on getting himself on as many playlists as possible uh, and he does it with great pride um 
but what I learned from it is that I can never be like Mikey. I can't. I I just want to be in the studio writing. I just want to be um, uh, recording, mixing, and I can't be fussed with too much nonsense on social media. And it, and as a consequence, um, that some will say, well, that's um, I'm if I'm not marketing, if I'm not doing my own promotion, then I'm just not going to find the avenues to to find new listeners. But do you know what? Fuck it. I, sorry about the swearing, but oh, no, I, you know, you, you get your breaks, and and um, and yeah. some people will recommend. And I kind of like the organic growth thing because it does mean that, with a couple of sep- exceptions, where I have just tested the water with with sort of promotion, uh, I, I know that most of the listeners have sort of come by word of mouth or just been featured on one of the shows on one of the internet radio stations. Yeah. Yeah. So so let's uh, shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about your journey as a as a producer. Um, so so how, how did you start out? What 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 was the, the the groundwork of your your first terrible recordings? Like like all well, of them, we all started the same way, right? Was it? Did you start well, with Garage Band or what was your what was your first uh, DAW? Your first well, that's. Uh, Good question. I mean, the first thing to say is to what is producing, because I think a lot of people call themselves producers, but they do it purely because they've, they've sat and used a door yeah. and come up with some stuff. And admittedly, they might have written it themselves and mixed it themselves. Mm-hmm. I, th- I, th- I think a producer to me is someone who is the traditional thing. I mean, it, it's like you were mentioning before we started recording, Tony Visconti is a producer. He's someone that has, has a grounding in audio engineering, songwriting, uh, techniques, and stuff like that. So how did I become that? Um, well, I got my first... So in 2003, I got a really, I got a quite a big promotion pay rise. Um, I had a couple of kids under the age of three, and I was in my early 30s. And I think I went to one car showroom to have a drive, a fast car. And I walked out of there. I thought I don't want to do this, but if I, I felt like I had to reward myself, so I walked into a a, a music shop in Brighton. Um, in so what's this? Nineteen years ago, and I bought a Mac Pro uh, and got a copy of Logic Pro Seven mm-hmm. uh, and just this sort of basic setup. And I just started to record myself on that. Um, and I'd been in bands um, since I was at, like the age of fourteen. Okay. Um, um and i i think the first five years just learning the ropes um the songs was were getting better but i i think if i look back at maybe soundcloud files that i did that nothing has survived because it was a a production quality that i probably are finding a bit embarrassing now and that was it really i kind of noodled along just chucked the occasional thing and sent it to a few friends and posted on facebook once that got you know in about 2007 it happened and i think it was 2008 when soundcloud started and yeah muddled along for about 10 years um and then i got asked i think the turning point was i got asked by sort of an old school friend he was in the year above i didn't know him brilliantly but he he'd sort of made it in the music industry he ended up being a session bass player for Jesus and Mary Chain. Uh, he did a, a couple of tours with Mission, mm-hmm. um, wow. and he he had decided, sort of, sort of in his late forties, that he wanted to go and do a degree in music, and he did it uh, as distance learning. But he needed to do an album as his sort of final project, and he just approached me and said, "Look, can I take your my favorite ten songs from your SoundCloud and and produce you?" So I would say that's when I worked out what production was and I, I i kind of learned three things um one is if i was going to be, be a producer i wasn't going to do it the way he did because he was quite a blunt guy um and um he sort of b- broke up my songs and rebuilt them in a way that i never actually enjoyed so it, what we ended up with was something i i don't like um so kind of understood that but the other thing he taught me was that getting your work onto the streams was actually a lot easier than I, I imagined. I always used to think it was the mystique. And I think I think everybody else has got on board now, but back in about 2018, 2017, it was it was unheard of. But he he discovered how you approach one of a few distributors and and 
voila three weeks later suddenly you can look on your spotify on your phone and you've got your music on there and i yeah. thought that was amazing so that was that's what i kind of i've learned from him um and then becoming a producer uh, that was i think the big break i got was um there was two the first time i got asked to do a remix was through uh kimbo now kimbo arranges has arranged the two acoustic sessions that have been on in your ears music and um kimbo's had a, a pretty tough time up until sort of a few months ago where she was battling breast cancer and she wow. organized this this fundraiser uh where basically in your ears music put, you know reached out and said send us your recording of yourself playing live uh keep it stripped back if you can do it on acoustic and basically kimbo um because i i i kind of knew her through that she offered uh, a guy called o paulo in uh he lives up in aberdeen where, where kimbo lives and and said do you, do you fancy doing a remix for him so i that was the first guy I ever remixed which was sort of the beginning of 21. i did a couple more um two of which haven't seen the light of day work but um until yesterday uh, one was uh, this track by a band called the Ras, uh, who were from Edinburgh, as, as I understand it, and they lent me the stems. And he's the, the lead singer of the Ras. Is just he's ten out of ten. He's got the best vocal cords, I think, in in the unsigned world. And I just bashed it into this invisible squirrel thing, where it sounded a little boy, bit like Fat Boy Slim or Chemical Brothers, uh, and it, it was a lot of fun. And it finally appeared on one of their EPs yesterday. Oh, nice um and then the the big break though for being a producer was um uh, another charity thing that was just came out came about on twitter where someone mentioned why don't we do a, a charity christmas single and i think initially it was going to be like um do they know it's christmas um uh, by the band-aid um and i think i just uh, immediately just thought okay well if we're going to do this we need a backing track so we can get everybody's vocal stems and amalgamate i hadn't really elected myself to do it but i worked quick so within about three hours i'd completely rip replicated the backing track to feed the world and just sent it to um, everybody on this whatsapp group that had been created um as a, as a consequence of this chat on Twitter, yeah, and within about within about two days, uh, it chopped and changed. I ended up doing uh, a sort of Joy Division version. Oh, nice! And the next thing you know, I, I was getting sent probably about twenty five different vocal uh, tracks from various artists and trying to find them space in this song that, that eventually we, I think, we put out um, as a YouTube video because we had a, a real problem with the copyright over it, um, from what I can remember. But that got a thousands of views and from that i got called a producer um yeah. which i felt a bit of imposter syndrome about but i, I think I, I kept on i had plenty of time off because of lockdown so i managed to keep on top i think there's a couple of people that i missed an email or a, or a direct message where they'd sent me their stems and there was a little occasional bit of fraughtness but it came out i think in the beginning of december and it was introduced uh by the um the fella who does the indie shout outs and i'm going to forget his name which is really embarrassing the guy that was in um train spotting the film what's his name uh bobby carlow um, okay yeah he introduced the video and that that was the break and ever since then i've i've produced i did a list earlier um and it's about 20 people i've either done a whole production or remixed or or you know done a whole album with a couple of people so it's been it's been a lot of work I yeah. say that. but but do you 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 find that do you find that for you that's that's the thing that you i don't know you get the greatest creative satisfaction from is it something completely separate from your composing and artist or you know where where, where um, would you place it in terms of priorities let's say well, well ultimately my ambition is to produce okay uh, other yeah. other people um i i enjoy releasing my own stuff but i always i've always considered them to be um a showcase for myself as a producer um okay 
um, to answer that question. Yeah, yeah. no, that, that, that's fair. That's fair enough. Mm -hmm. It's always interesting, you know, uh, to think about because I know we were talking before, and I, I, I use the moniker producer because no one else will produce me, <laughs> you know, type thing. And and but for me, like where where I really get excited is the arrangement. Mm -hmm. I love arranging songs. You know, it's just and it works well with producing, too, because a lot of times you'll end up rearranging things. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but but I, I really find that's where the fun is. It's like, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I'll, I've started like with my new record. I'll I compose on the, the keyboard and I really only know a few chords and I can't play. But what will happen is I'll sit down and I'll start putting together a chord sequence and I'll find something and I'll hear something. It's like, well, what's going on? Okay. I like that. And then I'll get it into the, the, you know, into the system recorded as MIDI. And once I've got the MIDI in, what's interesting, I found myself, I'm very visual when it comes to music, weirdly enough. Um, and it's always been that way. Like I can look at a, I'm very adept at editing sound files Mm -hmm. And I'm very adept at playing around with them. And I started off that way because I don't play an instrument. I've had to be, I've had to get very creative to fake things. Uh, and I've just gotten better and better at it. And and now mm -hmm. when I, I arrange, what's interesting is I'm, I'm trying to figure out, like I'll do a thing and I'll figure out, well, how's the bass part? Well, you just drop out a few and all that's how basses sort of work. And so I'll do that. Or, so, you know, I'll get to the point always with a song where it starts bo it starts boring you, right? And that for me okay. is always, you know, that's always a clear sign something needs to change. And then you have to get creative. Well, how are you going to change things? What are you going to do? And sometimes you'll bring in something different. Sometimes you'll play around with what you have. Oftentimes you'll pull things away because I also love showing the I love showing the the the, 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 st the structure of the song too. And then pulling out things like stops and breaks and, you know, all that, all the fun stuff that, that makes the song. Because I, I found that like when I, when I produce and I think w where I'd say I, I've got a little bit of the producer in me is I'm very interested in the details of a song because I found mm -hmm. listening to songs, those are the parts that stick with you or, or, or having a song where you're so confident about it that you've got like a hook line and you only play it once, right? And when you can do that and you've got two or three of those, it's great because as a listener, when I've, I, I encounter a song like that and you end up thinking, oh, that hook's all over the place. And then you listen to it closely and you realize, wait a second, that only comes up once. But what happened mm. is you ended up listening to the song five times to listen to that hook, <laughs> you know? And, and it's, mm. you know... Mm. And mm. but but no, it's that that's that's really very fascinating. Um, well, well it, I mean, I, I just before you move on, um, I can I tell you, I think a lot of people, um, when it comes to songwriting and how you construct a song and what where what you put where and how you use space, um, it, it for me, I think my groundwork. Um, where I really genuinely understood songwriting on, on, a, on a new level. So I spent a lot of time in a band throughout the 2010s mm. um, where we had a great guitarist, my mate Chris, who's a session player, and he's an absolutely brilliant guitarist, me singing okay, and on the piano. And, and what we did was we I had to write the rest of the band. So I used to program the drums and I used to, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Brass section, if I want, I could do a whole orchestra. Yeah. And then we would sit down and play over it. And um, what that meant was that I had to get a set of 30 to 40 songs and write my own backing track. So I, I would listen to these songs and I'd line them up in, in Logic, which is my door. Uh, if they were to a click, brilliant, because it would make it my love a lot easier. But you, you can sort of modify audio files so that it can all line up on the grid. And then I, I used to play in the bass, the drums, uh, and the horns. And what I learned from doing 30 or 40 top 10 hits, which we were going to cover, is that I learned how each of these songwriters construct mm -hmm. a song. And and that sort of insight, and, and, and I know a lot of people are quite snooty about playing in covers bands. But when you learn a new song by ear or, or just off a guitar tab and you try and 
get it as close as you can because you're that sort of covers band i think you learn a lot as a songwriter and and, and i when i hear youngsters you know in their, in their teens and early 20s being snooty about being in this cover band i always say now you need to be you need to be in two bands your band and a covers band to earn some pocket money so you can understand how other people do songwriting so that yeah. for me is probably the most important part is is studying and creating the backing track so i could play in this sort of little duo that i was in no, well, listen, it's fascinating. And I was at a, mm. this, a friend, a friend of mine organizes this impromptu sort of free concert in an actual garage in an alleyway. Every, you know, it's a summer thing. It's been going on for a few years. And I was speaking with one of the musicians at it a couple of nights ago. And, and he said something that was very fascinating. He said, you know, you know how jazz was created? And I'm like, okay, but tell me. I'm always interested in any musical lore or theory, whatever. And he says, jazz was created by musicians who were in these bands playing the same things 12 hours a day and got bored. That's where it mm. came from, right? Mm. It came mm. from them getting bored and playing these standards in different ways. Because they knew all the songs. They were all playing you know, the jazz standards because those were the popular songs at the time, right? So, yeah, I think you're completely right. I mean, my point is you're completely right in terms of the cover band. Or, or look at the Beatles. There's a perfect example. Cover band in mm -hmm. Hamburg. What were they? They're playing, what, 17 sets a night or something crazy like that, That's right? True. Yeah. And boy, yeah. oh, boy, by the end of that, they were they came back to Liverpool and they were they blew everyone else away, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because they, they knew all the yeah. stuff. But they also, they knew all the, they knew how, they knew the, the mechanics of all the stuff they really liked all the early mm. rock and roll stuff, right? Because that's mm. what they were playing, at, you know, as a cover band. Yeah. No, it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's true. No, it's, it's interesting. I, like you, had the luck of playing in bands as a singer. So I've got to experience a lot of the different things over time. I mean, none of the bands I was in was, were ever really that successful, but I had the experience of playing in front of reasonably large crowds and clubs, you know, the doing the practicing two, three times a week as you're composing and writing and creating songs. And then, mm -hmm. and then we got into the studio a couple of times back in when there was like there were real studios and that was the only place you could record. Uh, and that was a whole other experience, a disorienting one to a certain degree, because mm -hmm. you don't really play. It's not like any other playing you're doing, right? It's a lot more like, like, I guess what we both do now that it's all that we're living in the, the doll world. Uh, but yeah, and and for me, I always loved all three aspects of it. I mean, there's but there's nothing to compare with live. I don't know about you, but there's nothing that compares with live. You know that that yeah. feeling at the end of that euphoria at the end of a show when you've nailed it is. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. and it's unfortunate that so many people like now that it's all become sort of a bedroom, you know, bedroom industry. That a lot of a lot of people aren't forming those bad garage bands, you know, and then and also I think with COVID that a lot of the 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 locales where you'd be able to play in them aren't, you know, they're all going out of business too. So it's 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 too bad. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is. I, what it is. Yeah, I yeah I don't I. I am a studio monkey, to be honest, you know, and, I, and it's... Um, <laughs> well, fair enough. <laughs> I, well, I, I made the mistake. Oh, it's not a mistake. I moved away from the area. I, I, you know, I, I think I could form a band if I was living 70 miles up the M M40 up in the middle of, of England. Um, yeah. But I, I moved uh, sort of at the beginning of lockdown uh, to this area. So I haven't even been to an open mic, mic, mic mm -hmm. night. Um, so I think I'd, I'd like to play live, but... Um, I don't know. I've been. I've kind of got the T-shirt. I did all that. I got it out of my system in the twenties, and then you know, playing in covers band for a good decade. Yeah. Uh, up until twenty nineteen. So, I hear what you're saying. Um, yeah. I th yeah. Play playing live is um, with a, a sober crowd. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm not. I was never a fan of playing on Friday nights. You know, because everybody's drunk. But. Um, yeah, if you can get someone on a midweek, yeah, there's nothing yeah. beats it. Absolutely. No, no. I, listen, I I think that yeah. live is a young man's game, unless mm. you're famous, in which case you you know you get sort of a red carpet treatment in terms of it. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, but, but listen with me, I, I would, I'd love to play some of the stuff that I've created and played pretty well, everything myself on live with a band, because I know that there might be more in the material mattering on the type of music, more in the material, especially with the rock rockier stuff I do Mm -hmm. that a band would, uh, really amplify. Absolutely. Yeah. More than and, and having a drummer because let's let's face it I I I've I I've gotten better at programming drums mostly because I think I've taken a very good approach to it uh, yeah. in that uh, I don't know if you know what what's his name um, oh god uh, he's the name's completely Rick Beato okay he's okay. very famous uh, YouTube he's yeah. a studio musician producer from the states was relatively successful at a couple of big hits and then has a pretty big youtube channel i've one seen of, i've seen it yeah but one of the things that's great is he did this whole um episode of one of his shows on how to program rock drums and it's mm-hmm. absolutely fantastic because he goes through three or four patterns and shows you how to do it and the tricks to make them actually sound live like sound like actual drums and not like a drum machine and mostly yeah. it's just you set it up in MIDI and you play on the keyboard as if it's drums, <laughs> you know, and you follow there's certain patterns you, that a drummer would follow. Right. So, you know, you've got the the kick and you've got the snare and you pay, play the plat pattern and then you put the percussion on top. And so mm-hmm. that that's generally how I do it. And my stuff is just because I don't know, I lean in the fact that I, I don't know what I'm doing some of the time. And what happens is what comes out ends up being quirky. Uh, and then I'll lean into that too. And generally, I've, I'll, I'll end up getting better results than, you know, at least if it may not sound like anything else, but it doesn't sound bad. I mean, that that's my, my you know, th- that's one of the things I, I tend to strive for um, in that I want it, if, like, if it, like, like, I think, you were, you were saying it too, in terms of your stuff. I do it for myself. I love that mm-hmm. if, if someone really likes it, I'm very happy about this, but I'm doing it to amuse myself to a certain extent. And when I write music, it's to please myself. You know, it's, it's yeah. the stuff I like to listen to. Uh, and, and I, I enjoy and because I enjoy the whole process of it. It's just bonus, but, you know, a, a lot of the impetus of writing songs is like I, I hear something in my head and sometimes I have no idea where it comes from. Like I, I've, I've written songs and I'll, I'll, I'll work really fast sometimes and I'll have something down in an hour and it's basically complete. And then you putz around with it for six months before you release it, changing little details and fixing little things and whatever. But the whole thing is just comes out really quickly uh, and I like that. I always, I've always tried to make myself sound as if I'm a band playing it, you know, as opposed to a production, uh, you know, or, or I'll have a crazy idea and then I'll see if it works, you know? So, um, going back to your drums, um, mm-hmm. so I, I've never, I've never used drum loops. Okay. Um, yeah. I've never used any, drum loops. Any, well, I, yeah. and, I, and it's, so there's a, there's a couple of things um, that spring to mind about drumming. So so most people their platform is Logic, and Logic has a a thing called Drummer. And Drummer is uh, you choose your drummer, and it can be I think most people go for Kyle in our genre. Mm-hmm. And then you can say, you know, play me a verse pattern and play me this, and then you can slide up the complexity thing. And I, and I hear everybody using Drummer, uh, and and everybody uses it as a single channel and the compression that's already within that. So everybody sounds the same in the drumming. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. The, the one thing um, that turns me off music that I listen to from our DIY sort of indie community is that, you know, sound of logic drummer. And it, it's so easy. This is the frustrating thing is, is that I know that just a couple of video um, uh, on YouTube will help you a to work out how to, multi-channel it so that you can start to do things like dirty up the kick and make yeah. the snare have a bit of gate on it and but the other the other thing is that um you, carl has only got so many patterns so carl actually is still playing the same thing so everybody's got 
20 or 30 indie drumming sort of things. So everybody's got the same feel and swing. So, and anyway, it pisses yeah. me off. And, I, and, and uh, it's, but the <laughs> thing is not everybody can program their drums. So, and having yeah. programmed my drums, as you're describing that way you do is, uh, is the, the one thing that people forget is that you must always remember that you only have two arms and two feet. And, and um, what I hear often when, when people have programmed their own drums is, you're hearing hi hats and snares and crashes all at the same time, but they're not an octopus. So what you end up, what you should always do is when you're programming your drums, is that you play them in with your fingers, mm -hmm. do your hi hats first, and, and then play in your kick and your snare, and then go back in where, wherever the snare is underneath the hi hat, delete it because if they're double handed, they've got to take your hand away. So these are the things, and the, the, yeah. the sort of the, and the other thing is as well is that having found this groove because you've got that wonderful thing called quantize that has either made it a bit swing or, or straight is go back in and make it human again which is to to take every single midi note and tell it to go plus or minus 10 milliseconds either way mm -hmm. and impart those very subtle imperfections so th th they're the two things i'd always tell people if you're gonna, yeah. you're gonna program your own drums don't use kyle if you're on logic <laughs> Learn how to multi-track um, these drum programs so that you can uh, apply sort of uh, compression differently across yeah. the drum yeah. kit yeah. rather than yeah. the whole lot, yeah. you know, and saturation. Well, and, and also and, specifically for that for that drum because they, mm. they need different things, you know. And unless you're going yeah. for a room sound where you're mm. you have the the full night, that, that's I, I'm I'm surprised with that because myself my tendency with production is I've always wanted to separate my drum tracks. And have them all separate because then you can mix them properly, you know. Well, which, yeah, I mean, I, which you can't do if it's a if it's a kit, right? It's much more difficult to do if it's a kit. You absolutely. Know? I mean, I know that Jack White probably just had a couple of ribbons uh, over the top, and and that was his sound. They heavily distorted through, yeah. a, through a tape and, and a desk. But no, you you want to be able to saturate a kick so that it's, it's using up as least headroom but also sounding the loudest in the mix so that's yeah. why we separate and have the different microphones so and you can get that room sound you know you just push up yeah. the 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 pair yeah. the, the, the yeah, overheads and i found know. for me my, my the biggest revelation in terms of production and what's i probably brought mine up the, the most was uh investing the money and getting the the whole isotope suite the production suite that they have and specifically the the visual mixer because i said i'm very i'm very visual mm -hmm. uh in in create in my creative endeavors i guess and having that it was just so much easier to to mix and i can mix so much so so much more quickly to get like a, a basic mi mix that i like and get the definition and and also i don't know about you but when i'm i'm producing i i tend to to visualize, I guess it comes from having practiced in bands and being in rehearsal rooms and all that. I, I, I like having like the instruments having a place in the soundscape, like being somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. so so that the, the bass is maybe it's only panned over to one side, right? Because, you know what I mean? So that you get that, uh, you get more of a room sound as opposed to something where everything is just sort of squashed together and it's all one thing and yeah but but i found that that was very helpful in that or 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 also between the lead vocals let's say and backing vocals you know so that it it isn't i don't know if this is making any sense to you but you know for, for no, me yeah, I find it it's really important yeah yeah i mean mixing technique is um i think there's two aspects of position within mixing mm -hmm. um um, the mistake that a lot of people make when they're when you're using pan to create separation between yeah. other things. So we've got two ways of separating, haven't we? We've got EQ, so yeah. that everybody has its own little place. But the other one is where you are on the stereo field. But what a lot of people, again, I hear from the demos that I get is that that you a lot of these sort of piano um, patches that they've got a stereo and and the way that they would have set up a stereo of a piano would be that the low keys are at the left and the high keys are at the right and they've got a player position so often when you've got these really rich sounding patches that you have within within your um software package you have to mono them or you take you use something called a direction mixer and you bring it right in 
and then pan it because actually in, in the in the seven or eight elements that you've got running in a track what you don't want is a massive stereo track even though you've panned it over all it's going to do is going to um for that piano example is just to make the low notes louder and then the, the high notes quieter so yeah if you're putting if you're adding layers within a song when you're mixing if you are the sort of person that likes to do a lot of panning mm -hmm. make make sure you you make that um stereo recording a lot more mono before you pan it because you'll it, it'll just sit in the mix better that's that's something a lot interesting a lot of people, no, that's, uh, that's, yeah i mean that's the type of stuff i really have no idea of and it's all very mm -hmm. much trial and error because of my complete lack of any well, i don't know I, sometimes it's, it's a interest in the theory of it because it's uh well it, the thing is mine i i kind of you you warned me what you would ask so you know and yeah I, i'm not really a very um organized person but I oh no 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 it's, it's no problem so i the, the, if you were going to ask for some tips that yep. i've learned probably in the last three years from watching thousands of hours of videos and learning how not to do it by trial and error that i would say what i was touching on earlier when when you mix a track you know you have eq and you have panning and we've covered that really we understand that um but there, there is a subtle aspect of um mastering which i mm -hmm. i guess you may well do yourself when you put stuff out and that's something called mid side and um uh, it's just something i say just google it and what mid side is to a layman like me who hasn't done anything like a, a degree in audio engineering is mid is basically the mono signal so the the when the two speakers of a, of, a, of your setup whether they're headphones yeah. or speakers when they're identical that's going straight down the middle as far as your perception is going and that's the mono and then the side is arguably what's different what's the stereo and when you when you mix um and you put eq on your master bus what will come out if you haven't put any eq on it will be a, a balanced version of what you've mixed but what you want to do is you want to keep the lower frequencies a mono because arguably low frequency you can't see which direction they're from so you want all the bass well you know the bottom end of the bass the bottom end of the kick any sub bass that you've added just to give a bit more depth and the sort of bottom end of floor toms and the, mm -hmm. and the snare you you have them running in mono um and and then the rest of the thing the sparkle and the glitter of the track which is you know the, the mid to highs of, of keyboards guitars voices yeah that's that's what you come out the side to uh, and i'm not going to explain anymore because it's it, you can only visualize it if you see an eq map and i you can't do that but yeah i'd say google or, or put, type into a search on um, YouTube about how to do mid-side processing and, and you'll learn a lot how to open out a mix without actually doing with doing very little um, yeah so that's something uh, I learned probably about 18 months two years ago and it, and it sort of revolutionized the sound that I was getting and then beyond that yeah you, you've caught you've called it already uh, use panning um, so yeah you start to mix mix in mono so get the balances right and don't even touch any panning until you got the sound coming out of a mono signal yeah and it sounds right nothing is dominating too much and when you when you unmono it and it goes stereo it, it all you know that everything is right because when someone is listening on one of these it's going to yeah. sound balanced and I, that, that that is another tip that i, I sort of learned probably on album two um so they, they would be my two main tips uh, yeah that, that's uh mixing. you just yeah. picked up my my final decider on whether or not a mix is ready it has to sound good mm -hmm. out of the speakers on my phone <laughs> yeah yeah I, your reference mix is um uh, sometimes even yeah. more important than, than when although, you although have you invested I, I i became interested i noticed i think it's is it steven slate it's one of the one of the anyway one of the the sort of plug-in producers that has a whole suite of actual reference monitor setups i don't know if you, okay. you've seen that no which no. i thought was quite interesting they basically they've simulated like 20 famous uh control rooms from studio okay. so you can actually hear what a mix would sound like from board x using monitors y in a certain room that's been set up properly, you know, in this problem, yeah. you know, and mm -hmm. I always thought that would be quite interesting to, to listen to. 
mattering on how ambitious you're, you're, you know, you decide to, to do a, a project. It's like, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm sometimes pretty obsessed. Less so musically. I, well, I, I, I'd say it's a, it's a bit of both, but I, 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 I love to play of the Pink Floyd records. Um, you know, Dark Side of the Moon and, and even more Wish You Were Here. I think they're just great records from a production standpoint, you know, among all the other good things about them. And what I what I liked about is is just the ambition of the recording. You know what I mean? And yeah, and yeah. and I thought that it would, you know, at some point I'd love to do something that ambitious where you're really going to get to try to get the absolute perfect sound. Uh, and the and a perfect mix, which I think they achieved on some points. You know, they they really you, you, they really stand up when you play them. Like I've got a cousin who has like about a I don't know sixty seventy eighty thousand dollar stereo setup, a Macintosh stereo setup, right? Because he's a real mm-hmm. audiophile, and listening to things on his system are just eye opening. Well, ear opening, I guess would be the, the, the proper word for it, right? You know, because yeah. my, my system, I mean, I've got some reasonably good monitors. It's sort of cobbled together because I, I you know, my my control room is my living room, um, you know. But I, it's OK, because I like I like you, like you were saying, you mo- you have all these different reference monitors, right? I'll do them on the monitors. I do it on headphones. I do it on my phone. I do it on my iPad. I'll listen to the speakers on my laptop, you know. If I had a car, I'd had have, have it on the car stereo, um, because yeah, that you find that that's where you find the mistakes, and it, it's no, I, and actually what you were saying before about doing the mono for the low end stuff makes a lot of sense, and I'm definitely going to check it out because I think that some of the problems that I have experienced that I haven't been able to figure out stem from that. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't want to confuse you mid mid side is basically using two eqs in series mm-hmm. and what you're doing one of the one of them you concentrate on the mid and the other one is on the side and it's it's black magic and anyway yeah. when once you've yeah. seen the video but i it's interesting you talk about bass um um sub bases um you know when anything below i don't know is it 80 or um we're talking about that very low yeah most speakers are not punching anything out below 55 60 um i bought i re i replaced my speakers and i think i went from a my bottom end was 55 and now i'm i'm 40 and i suddenly thought oh sh- christ there's a lot of sub bass in my music and um and my my immediate reaction was sorry some burglar alarm is going off. Oh, no. um my immediate reaction was just to wipe everything below 45 off um my tracks because i didn't know what it was doing so if i couldn't hear it but I, I've come to the conclusion probably in the last three or four months, actually, sub bass doesn't have to be loud. Um, um, so essentially, play it when you solo the track of sub bass that you've got, it, it should be around about minus 20 dB. And it doesn't have to be louder. And when, when you bring everything back in and unsolo it, you can't hear it. But the thing yeah. is, what that does is it, it sets up the speaker cones i don't know what's going on but the point is is that it suddenly adds a a warmth even though it's imperceptible so i've i've probably the 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 last the album with the squirrel and and the album that's coming out on Bandcamp. those those two is the first time i've actually embraced sub bass and um it's just it's taking me up another level so i would i'd read into it and it's well worth looking at whether your monitors will take an extra sub bass unit and you start bringing it into your sphere because most car stereos actually do have a sub bass unit so you're hearing stuff that you probably can't on your monitors at home yeah Um, well which is why they're so popular as as sort of uh reference monitors right i i know who was it was it uh rick rubin i think he always his his final mix was always on a car stereo you know, yeah. it there. Yeah. but it makes it makes sense, especially if they do have like a subwoofer. You yeah, know, um, yeah, absolutely. you're not going to. But but what the point I was going to make is that I've noticed it with some mixes where they sound great on this, the, the monitors. They sound great on the head headphones and I'll play it on my phone and the whole bottom end is gone. Yeah, um, you know, and so and, and that's obviously but- exactly this this issue yeah. that you know it's all it's all below what the because I, I mean especially especially phones and cheaper 
like the the little earbuds and that they have no low end to them of course and i, I, yeah. I think it's something like 100 hertz you can't expect yeah. you know a phone with the dimensions it's got to, to oh, no. check out anything below that and in a way um if you've written a song that is going to be played predominantly by people on their phones i.e for kids and stuff like that then you if you've made bass an integral part of your song, then you're not actually don't know your market. But I don't. I I don't write stuff for phones. Um, but it's nice to know. Sometimes you do get a you sprinkle too much saturation on your final mix, and before you know it, it just sounds like a jar yeah. of wasp. So I, I, you would always reference mix, mix on your phone speakers. But I don't. If the if the bass isn't there, I don't lose any sleep. Oh no no. But, but in, unless uh, I, I yeah. find unless it 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 was something integral to the song, and oftentimes you can. Mm. It, it's a bad mix. Like what what, yeah, what, yeah. You're, what you're hearing is it's because the mix is isn't isn't optimal. Well, well thank God they wrote uh, another one bites the dust before we had mobile phones. You know. <laughs> yeah, it never would have been that popular, right? Enough, although, no, although I think the, the I mean the, there was a similar issue with AM versus FM radio, right? Because AM mm. radio is is not as high fidelity by any means uh you know and and what you know and they were literally writing for what sounded good for for mm -hmm. an am signal so there's, yeah. there's nothing new under the so so let's talk about uh, invisible squirrel a little bit because i got into that and i have to say i i kept starting i kept hearing musical references that i think not many people <laughs> but the two of us would know um, yeah. including, I can't remember which song it is, but there's like a sequencer line in us as listening to it. And it's like, that's from being boiled. That sounds a lot like being boiled. See, I, I, I read that message you sent me and you didn't, and think it, you didn't is that an or, orange? Is that an orange juice? No, right? no, no, no. Being boiled so, was, was the human leagues first single. Well, um, yeah, I don't, you like can't early, early, in like pre pre reproduction. Yeah, well, that must have been sort of mid '80s, which is very much. No, 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 it was sound. earlier than that. It was seventy. Really? Seventy-eight. Oh shit. Seventy-nine. Wow. The okay. first thing. It was the the B side, if I'm not mistaken. It was the B side of Gordon, the Gordon's Gin ad that they did, which I think was their first rec recording. Okay. Well, um. Yeah. Sub subliminally, it's worked its way into my writing. So. Well, no, but well, I yeah. think it, I think that they were they don't really get the credit they deserve mm. uh, in mm. terms of, of being pioneering sort of electronic musicians, because most people remember the second iteration of the band, the much poppier one mm. Mm. because before mm. they split off, there were two, they split off to two bands, right? The singer yeah. and the guy who no one quite knew. It was sort of like the Sid Vicious of the band mm. uh, became the human league that had all the hits you know, don't you want me and all that with the when the, with the when they hired the two girls? You're talking the other... Philoki. Philoki is the singer, wasn't he? Philoki. Yeah, Philoki. Uh, and mm. the other two guys who did all the music that were really the the driving force behind the thing became BEF, the British uh, Electric Foundation or whatever it was called. All right. Okay. And they, well, they had good. a career doing. You know, they had one hit. It was actually a pretty good song from the. I think they did two or three albums that didn't didn't do so well uh but they 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 put out two really really good very electronica albums in the i think mm. one came out in 79 and the other came out in 80 or 81 well that, that uh, you know music is music um you know we all we all know that that, that the formative years when we're, we're first allow allowed to choose our own music you know yeah. from the age of 10 and then we get to that stage where we can start buying it ourselves. So, you know, the real sweet spot is about 15, 16, where you've got enough pocket money to go out and, you know, yeah. and for us, it was, it was probably just before CDs maybe. And then the, you know, vinyl was still going. And um, yeah, my, my time was uh, about 81 when I started secondary school. Um, um, so I was listening to, um, sort of early depeche modes yeah um yeah all those things and i i mean i still i liked rock um but you know all the all the obvious people like gary newman um i can remember listening to autobahn by Kraftwerk. i think yeah. i had that i had that on vinyl 
and that was sort of embedded and it sort of it lay dormant for quite a long time and again as i said earlier when i bought this package by arturia i've suddenly saw i can unleash all these sort of inner sort of synth wave as they now call it yeah. which is yeah. I, I think is a rather lazy way of saying something that sounds a bit 80s but um uh -huh. and that's what's that's what's been going on really for um june 21 is when i i decided to separate my electronica from my albums invent this cheeky little fella called invisible squirrel you know um when it, he he is basically a naggy little git he, he just he would send a dm to some band and say just heard this track any chance i could remix it um for most of the in fact the whole of 21 i did it just saying it's just for free you know and if you don't like it you can bin it it's not a problem but most of them with a couple of exceptions people have been very happy with it there's yeah. been quite a few, a few releases i mean I, uh, joe peacock was the last thing that came out and he his no actually joe peacock and the raz so joe was about three weeks ago raz was um yesterday and this is stuff that takes me about I don't know, six or seven hours. I think Joe's took about three because he, he had he had already had one synth patch and the and the and he had, there was a drum loop that he had got and um I just expanded on that. Um it doesn't take long. I think the, the trick is is just to know all the tricks to making um uh, electronica sound big and bold. Um and yeah. you know, you don't have more than three things going on at the same time. If you've got a lot of low end, make sure that uh, it's balanced um god I, I, it's a bit esoteric i mean the one thing i've noticed is that the it's a very uh, probably of all the mark the markets i can't believe i use that word all the genres in music the one that is most crowded is electronica so it remains a, a lot of fun um but again i just had a stroke of good luck i sent this sort of 30 minute mix that i did Sent that to band camp and that got chosen as well. <laughs> no, it's good listen, hey, yeah. you know. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, when you were talking about Pink Floyd, I think mm -hmm. I've had a couple of people say that this mix is a bit Floydy. Now yeah. I, I, to me, I'm kind of when I first hear it, I'm thinking, really? Um, because I want it to sound like Chemical Brothers. Um, I want to mm -hmm. sound like early Depeche Mode, yeah. um Prodigy. Um stuff like that but i have the, there's a musicality to my electronica which is probably a bit separate to what you normally and most people are just dragging colored blocks in on ipads or or garage band or if they you know the the probably the what is it called ableton live which is yeah. still a, a very much an architecture that's based around loops and actually writing in your own so i, I the only loops I will ever use probably is sort of the top line. So if there's a little bit of glitter rhythmically I need, I might just find something that's chittering away in the background. But everything else I'll always write myself. Um, and I use a lot of very distorted Hammond organ. Uh, I play my bass with my fingers. So I'm not playing a bass, but I use yeah. a, a great patch called the Rickenbacker bass. And there's a, there's a mm -hmm. patch on there with native instruments. Um, it's the muted one. And it's got a like a really great sounds a little bit like a Hofner Liverpool bass, but just a right. little bit more body to it. And that ends up doing most of the funk bass lines that I do. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that's the Squirrel. He's he, again, he's been sort of chundering along doing remixes. No, um, it's and then suddenly I get this band camp thumbs up, and it's like, oh, what do <laughs> I do now? It's it's a it's a, a decent mix, and then when people hear it. Um, there are there's probably a couple of sort of six to seven minute passages in there that i'm massively proud of that the, the beats are big uh they're all programmed by myself and they're all interacting with all the synths so there's some yeah. there's a complexity to it i don't over make it over complex it's all about nodding your head they're, they're all in a between 105 and 110 bpm so there's nothing you can't get up and dance to it unless you like doing it slowly but it, it's a head nodder so it's um it's been a really interesting um month what with joe peacock's remix um the ra's releasing yesterday and then this thing with bank I, it's just i don't know man i should go and buy Probably a lot congratulate you know <laughs> pat yourself on the back you know have a have a you know have a celebratory drink over it it's you oh know, you know yes. or, or two <laughs> yes yeah no, you, I mean, are yeah. you are you familiar with uh with the uh it's uh it's it's interesting i first got into music again 
and started this whole odyssey of, of self-production and, and this whole part of my musical career by hearing that um, iPad was a great place to, you know, to do music on. So I heard that mm -hmm. a friend had an old iPad he gave me. I ended up waiting. There was, I think it happened right before one of the big sort of sales, like, you know, Black Monday type thing. Mm -hmm. Spent $50 or so, ended up getting a DAW and a few programs and some synths and this little program that allowed you to take different, you know, record different, uh, pro like it was an interface program and started that way. And one of the programs that I discovered that was a mainstay that I used for a lot of, well, you, I think you said you'd listen to um, uh, Barbarians. That's written mm -hmm. using this method. And yeah, basically, yeah. there's this program, it's called Figure. And it was released as basically a joke promo sketch pad by uh, Propellerheads. Yeah, yeah. Synth makers. I know so the one. Yeah. It, I yeah. It on my phone. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I, I use that in with the iPad. And what I what I started doing well is I had that I I couldn't play and it's it's beautiful if you can't play because you can actually make something that sounds okay quickly. Uh, so I'd, I'd come through, do all these sounds, like do all these basically sketches, find something I liked where there was you know there's a spark to it, there's a hook, there's something that's interesting. Throw that mm -hmm. into well now what I do is I I'll plug it directly into my laptop and audio in the each track and then start working from that so work from basically audio tracks then right yeah i, I your and, your your productions are i mean i'm sorry to interrupt there but oh um, no 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 problem no, it's paradoxically when i hear someone who has no musical training you know, and it's just doing it in an exploratory method. There's sometimes, I mean, that, that was the thing. I, what I liked about that track that you're mentioning there, um, Barbarians, was that there was there was a lot of discordance, but it was right. So it's kind of like, it's kind of two fingers. It's like, sod your musical. And, and I, I kind of like that sort of thing because arguably, I you know, you spend so yeah. much time trying to find harmony and melody, but sometimes discordance works for me. And I, so that's what I liked about the, um, a lot of that album is that you can tell you you sometimes it doesn't work, you know. Yep. The, the, but um, yeah, it's uh, experimental. I mean, I, that's the thing. There's a lot of snobbery in music, um, and I, I sometimes exhibit it. Um, but what you do have is that you've got you sound like you've got a good ear, um, and also there, there weren't any imperfections about it because quite often I hear. DIY musicians, they, they've recorded it and there's latency, which they haven't quite picked up on. So everything, you know, certain parts are coming in late. And even though they, these doors promise that if you press a particular button then record it, there'll be no latency, they lie. Um, and there are a lot of plugins. Yeah. I mean, and my native, my native instruments plugins, even when I've got the latency protection on, it can be up to 45 milliseconds behind so i have to adjust each instrument due to depending on its complexity because for some reason apple and native instruments haven't got their heads together and, and got rid of this yeah. problem so you can hear that that looseness within what, what it's the difference between sounding like a demo and sounding like a polished item and, and nearly everybody that sends me stems so that i have to mix and master one of the things i have to do is compensate for the latency and you can only the only way to do it is with your ears um yeah so and in a funny yeah. way i find that restrictions sometimes liberate you and and and, mm -hmm. and you get you get more out of them because with me the system that i have now i i need to buy a new a new imac at some point because i'm starting to get into problems if you have got too many tracks right yeah, yeah. Um, you know, where, where you start getting the lag and, and stuff like that. And then, you know, the system runs out of memory and whatever. So so what I do a lot of the time is once I've locked down a track and I'm relatively pleased with it, I'll render it and I'll use it as an audio track. 
And okay. once you're doing right. that, you it's much e easier to hear those latency issues, and it's also much easier to correct them because you just make the little you make the nudges a little bit here or there. And I'll play around with that a lot too. Okay, uh, but um, it's because it's since the beginning. It's it's like if anything, I'm more of a tape editor or v virtual tape editor than anything else. Uh, because sometimes too, when I've run into problems, because I, I don't because I don't play anything, the biggest challenge I have is lead instruments, right? Okay. I mean, how do you fake a lead instrument? I mean, you can do two ways. The current project, I found a, a very competent guitarist and he can do the leads, <laughs> you know, so, and, and everyone's happy and he'll, pr he'll provide me with stems and I'll mm -hmm. edit them. I'll redo them. I, but sometimes I'll change the melody. I'll add, you know, from his, from his tracks. And I'll, I'll get what I like, right? Because I, I'm confident enough with my tape editing abilities to play around with things and, and get, a, get a good sound. But, you know, oftentimes I think that if you don't, uh, I've sort of lost my train of thought, but what, 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 was, what was the actual point we were, were talking about? And I'll remember it. So I get, I get too deep um, in the weeds. Well, you what you were talking is about your process of recording and i was talking oh yeah about well yeah so sorry so, so my, my yeah the, so so what i found with my process of recording is that i'll at times what i'll end up doing is if i'm looking to create something of interest because the song's starting to lag and get a little bit boring oftentimes i'll look and i'll i'll start playing around with uh little snippets you know, or, or or the other thing when I was trying to do leads and I can't do because I, I can't play, you know, to a proficient, proficient enough level. I just noodle around. And maybe out of a two minute noodle, there were 10 seconds that were good. Just through sheer happen chance, I happened to come across something that worked. Right. I'll then yeah. take that. And maybe there's two or three of those segments. I'll mash them together. And that will become a lead line. Yeah, but it has yeah. to sound good, right? Like, like you, you're not just doing it to to fill in time, uh, you know, or to fill in space. But and and lean into the like the biggest thing I would would suggest to anyone, and, and please contradict me if you've had different experience. But my biggest, the biggest piece of advice I'd give to anyone in terms of production is look for the part that's not working, right? That you don't think mm -hmm. is working, dig into that and make it work. And that will be the best part of the song. Like, like lean into the mistakes, you know? Mm -hmm. And it also means like, like if I'm I, I I prefer producing things as much as possible live. That's why I like as soon as I can get away from MIDI and turn it into a performance and lock it down, the better. Because like you said, we were, you were talking about drums before those, it's those little mistakes and the yeah. little things that are a bit different that you both humanize the actual performance and make it seem as if it's someone playing it. And it's what your, your ear notices, right? Your ear yeah. notices that that's what it does notice. Uh, and, and if you're, if you emphasize those things, those are the things that people are going to remember, you know, it's just like having the audacity to have like a really, really good hook and restrain yourself so you only play it once you know yeah yeah um, if you can like like you might sometimes you want to play the hook over and over again and if you've got one but sometimes the hook it's like one time the hook is memorable if you yeah. play it three times in the song it's forgettable yeah do, you know listen, listening to you wax lyrical about your process and 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 i say that your process is one where from it you can write an album of quirky synth based um that the, when i listened to it i would never write that because i come from a you know classically trained background yeah. i've done 19 years um learning how to mix and write and stuff like that and then you come along and you've got plenty of time to lock down and you just let it all out and it was great it's kind of it's quite i mean i'd recommend anybody who watches your your show to have a listen to it because oh thank you this it's kind of got it's it sounds like early depeche mode doing sparks i think it's best <laughs> <way to do. laughs> that's 
that's fantastic. They, Thank you. They had a they had a couple of cheap synths, but they had all the weirdness going with it. I mean, if you had a little Hitler moustache, mate, you would just. You would <laughs> oh, well, I, I could I could do one pretty but, easily. <laughs> no, that that's no, no, that's a fantastic, you know, compare. You, but to get to get to to where I'm going and, and via your music is, I think um, the the two two and a half years of, of the enthusiasm that you you've gained from just being part of, right at the beginning of this creative process is and I, and it's it is hundreds of thousands of, of people like us who who have the resources and I had the time during during yep. these long periods of lockdown to explore that creativity and and to hear you talk about it is is great the only the only thing I will say for the millions of people like yourself is to never feel ever that you've come close to doing what is your best work. And I'm still oh. there. Twenty years on, I still so I, I I struggle to even rationalize and 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 be empirical about how things work with me because it quite often I think the beautiful mistakes are, uh, are, are stuff and and. I st- I'm learning all the time, and I, 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 I find it really difficult explaining how I do things. Yeah. Um, and it's so have, listening to the way you talk about music, and and doing it on this sort of tidal wave that, of this this resurgence you've got that was presented to you due to this pandemic. It, it's great to hear, and I know there's so many people like that. Um, yeah. Whereas me, I've sort of been kind of grinding it out for 35 years and and literally only in, in the last year i've seen any sort of modicum of of acknowledgement or i hate to use the word affirmation from it and it, it, it's um and it there's still plenty within both of us um uh, yeah well the, years, you know so, um, the, the, the the thing for me that i find is that i've i've noticed with as with many things in life it's a marathon not a sprint and none of this comes quickly, you, you know, including this this channel. I mean, I've just started up this channel, love doing it because I love talking with other musicians and, you know, exchanging ideas, finding finding out new things. Uh, but I made the commitment and I've decided I'm just going to continue doing it because, you know, you look at and this to get back to your point, you look at there's a couple of channels on YouTube that do similar things that are very popular and, you know, and, and I really like, and I sort of take them as good examples on what to do. And some of them they're on episode 500, episode 600, and Mm. they didn't get successful until they were on episode 400. (coughs) And and if you're doing something once a week, episode 400 means you've been at it for four years at that point. Mm you know, before it gets yeah. noticed. So, and I think it, it, you know, I think it's good with music. It's the same thing. You know, it's, it's partly your story is you, if you love it, you're just going to keep at it. And at some point the world's going to catch up, you know, <laughs> well, you it's, true. it's true. You know, well, no, no, I, I have a quite pronounced imposter syndrome. Um, and I, yeah. you know, well, well, you I, should I, listen. You shouldn't. I, I, I think I, I've, I, I've luckily never had that. But, but, and I'm surprised. If you were the singer, I'm, I'm shocked. You know. Well, I, I could, no. I could, the thing I is, I, I think I, I have uh, to have a little bit too much ego. <laughs> I'm glad we we've, we've re- ruled out that misconception. I was always a, a, a backing singer at most in, oh, in, when okay. I was then when I was serious did. in bands. Um, but no, it was only in 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 sort of 2014 to 18 where i actually started singing uh and so you were late that's you were still late. a work in progress yeah i'm not yeah. claiming to be a, i'm still i'm never going to be a lead singer i don't possess but you know you the, know what you listen i i when i started out singing i also do a pretty good baritone uh and most of the bands i was in you know i, I sort of doors did a lot of sort of doorsy covers because i could do the jim morrison thing uh this latest release the the one i'm working on right now i discovered my inner my inner uh jimmy summerfield oh and i i do i've got this falsetto that is on a couple of the tracks it's i i have no idea where this thing comes from 
Nice. No, I've, that's one thing I've always wanted is a, is a good falsetto. I, my falsetto. I've got, like, I don't have any falsetto. I've got a Terror. good, uh, you know what I mean? It's, I, yeah. I found, I, I, it's, it's funny because I love singing with the effects in, in channel. So I can hear the final of my vocals and then I'll play around with it. Just in mm. the same way that a lot of times when I do a lead line, I'll sing it three times. You know, I'll find I'll get to the point that I, I like the way I, it sounds. I like my phrasing, and then I'll sing it two other times where I'll go a little. I'll 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 go to add emphasis to the phrasing, mm -hmm. right? So I'll get the harmonics that way, and because it's my same voice, you get that sort of family harmonics because it's in the same as you know the Everly Brothers. Why did they sound so great? They were brothers, right? Why did the staple singers sound so great? Why were their harmonies so fantastic? It's because they were a family, right? Mm -hmm. And literally, it does make a, the Beach Boys. They were all cousins, brothers and cousins, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and on the same principle, if you can actually sing where you can sing it, you, know, you sing the same phrasing multiple times, the vocals, when you put that together as a, a lead vocal line, has presence like you wouldn't believe compared to one one voice yeah yeah uh, the, the the double or triple track vocals is um it's kind of taken on a a, a whole new level really i think i find that you hear it ha hearing a single voice actually in, in recordings these days is is more the exception um and uh yeah the double the i don't, I've used it in probably about three or four of um, the tracks on my ten track album, and um, on top of that, what if you you can make it four? So if you if you sort of pan it about two o'clock and you know ten o'clock, um, but then if you put a, a micro delay, uh, which is uh, on e each voice, and you end up with sort of four bouncing around, and you get the a vocal effect that you hear when people discover how to do it, they use it on everything, like me. I pretty much, <laughs> I love doing it's it because it, it's kind of, I think J Jerry Rafferty was the first person to sort of try it out in the sort of about like '74 with um with his first big hit, and then and then you hear it a lot, a little bit more in the '70s. But it's just one of those dark secrets that maybe only a couple, three or four engineers knew how to do. But now everybody does it because you can press a magic button on on his own and it will do the magic vocal thing. But yeah, yeah, I like yeah. to do. I, I, I like to do everything old school, and then we didn't actually talk about what I only use ozone. I only use the the, the limiter, the the analog limiter, and yeah. um, the stereo widener. I, I don't use any of the other stuff wow. um, because, okay. yeah, because it. I think if you're kind of pressing the magic button on ozone, I know some people sort of live their life by it. Um, it's throwing a, it's changing all the dynamics of the mix that you've got. So essentially, I just want to bring the noise floor up. Not the noise, the, the the dynamic level up. I don't want to ever to clip. Um, or in other words, I don't want to ever see the limiter working beyond unity. Mm -hmm. And yeah. and then the stereo widener again is kind of well, all you're doing is you're increasing the panning. So yeah. when you, but you're doing it as a, as an EQ section. And, and but that stereo widener is really good. It's my recommendation if you're going to do a bit more electronic, because you actually automate those. Um, the, the you know the tip, particularly the top the air of of any mix you can actually start to get that to pump with width so it's mm -hmm. actually putting everything above like, let's say five thousand hertz you can you can draw in with automation um this breathing so you can make things breathe with with the oh, widener wow. so I, I i use the widener a lot to sort of impart a, a dynamic which you can't kind of get i know what he's doing there it's not it's a it's a really good thing and also when you when you end up with um like a big long reverb tail like at the end of a song and you've got that sustain of all the different thing as it's finished mm -hmm. what you don't you kind of do your fade out and it might last five seconds it might last 15 but you can you can also use the widener at the end there so it just kind of explodes in your head so oh, these are so that's that, that the ozone is, is great for yeah. automating the widening. Thing yeah, I, I uh, like literally my real go to is the, the visual mixer, which is how I do all my mixes. Um, so you're I, saying that you, you see all the little. Well, we, we, no, within, all right, within uh, what is it, Neutron, right? Which is sort of their flagship uh, plugin, right? 
Yeah. Neutron yeah. within the the suite. There's also Neutron. There's Neutron Visual Editor. Okay. Or Visual Mixer. Sorry. And basically, what it is is you have a every there's a, another thing I think it's called Relay, or you can use one of the plugins, and then they'll appear visually on like a screen mm -hmm. with uh, a center line. So that's obviously zero. And then, and then the other axes are left, right, and also the volume, obviously, up and down. Mm -hmm. So you can place every track visually in that sort of matrix and okay. then start playing around with it. And what's, what's good is it's really like I, when I was visually, when I was mixing from a board, what, what I found is that it, it, it's very easy to lose things. If you, you know, if you lower the volume to a certain thing and it, it goes that it's sort of not really, it's just something in the background. And if you, especially if you've got 24 channels or whatever going because you're, you're doing something a little bit too ambitious, mm -hmm. uh, it's easy to sort of start losing tracks and, and panning. It's easy to forget where things are, pan you know what I mean? Whereas this, it's all just, you see it as, as is. So if, mm -hmm. if a track is is at minus 10 dB in your mix, you can easily see it. It's down in the lower part of your mix. If it's on the right side or the left side, it's there. And you can play around with effects then to see, well, what, what would happen if I did this quite quickly and yeah. easily? But it's also, mm -hmm. I, I'm very visual when it comes to that. Just in the same way, like I can sit and look at a wave file and find and know what the beats are going to be or i can take a wave file of drums and, and re-edit it right or find you know a note and, and play around with notes and because i've done it all it's you know it's how it's how i've created things right and got mm -hmm. myself around problems like solve problems but i don't think everyone does it so visually and partly it's you know it's i i trained as well for a while as a visual artist and did painting at one point and whatever so you know i've, I've i guess i'm just sort of a visual thinker so it's an easy way for me to convert it but like like with with the ozone i use that um I, sorry I, I love the ozone for for the mastering because that that for me has always been the hardest problem that i've had mm -hmm. uh getting things sounding good and beyond that i just i'll, I'll use the nectar because it, it's the other the nectar and the neutron they're just easy because they're really good plugins uh, in mm -hmm. terms of the standard stuff, uh, you know, your reverb and your just all the, you know, the limiting and whatever. And, and I'm too, you know, I, I'm just rather than spending thousands of dollars and having 500 different plugins that I have to update and keep manage and find and remember, I'll just use this because it's, it's already pretty good. Well, yeah. I'm glad, I'm glad you're talking about. I mean, a nectar and, and neutron. I I know they're there, and um, yeah. I've never read the manual. And I've never clicked on them, um, and I, it sounds like they they can shorten the amount of time. But the one thing about vocals um, in a digital age, uh, which it always perplexes me, is that, um, when when you do a vocal take, you obviously you know the lower you are, the quieter you are, and and sometimes your proximity to the microphone changes, so the actual dynamic levels are all over the shop. Yeah. And then you stick them stick them through these um, wonderful compressors, and you put maybe three in series, and suddenly you've got you've got rid of all the dynamic. But um, I I use very little compression. I only use it actually just to have some of the saturation that comes with it, and mm -hmm. and just slightly flanning, never more than a couple of dB of compression. I know I just go in with with my scissors and i and i will all the bits that are quiet and if i want to extend and you know yeah. and i and i and i cut the audio up um of a vocal take and at the end of it all the dynamics are right sometimes you overdo it and you might find oh, i better yeah, yeah, sound yeah. that bit louder and um to me I did, to get a really balanced vocal track um we should all be doing that, you know, instead of messing around. Oh, no, no, no. Listen, I will definitely, it really matters. For the longest time before I ended up buying all of the uh, isotope stuff, uh, my go-to was really uh, delay. 
you know i i most yeah. of the vocals i'll do i'll i'll put a bit of slap back on it just like an old like the 50s plate basically and you get that little bit of reverb in the back you know a little bit of echo that fills out the sound and i i find that like i find it really difficult to do vocals just with with bare vocals you know and and what's interesting is like in my last release on on the ep the last one jerk there's one one song called focused instruction and it how that song happened is i was playing around with nectar because they've got all of these different like settings for you know it's like harmonized boy bands you know or what like all these crazy and i found one and it was the first time i did my jimmy somerville like and there was there's this one effect on it that's got i don't know what kind of treat but it's got a certain treatment and i started playing you know i was just fooling around with the mic and I got this sound and it's like, whoa, what's that? It's like, that sounds really interesting. And I, I started playing with it and pushing it, right? Like, like singing into the effect to see what effect I could get. And half an hour later, I had this, this crazy vocals that I did. And then I wrote music around it and that became the song, you know, and then I wrote the other part to break it up. But, but the whole thing is just that. And me then, taking those sections because i had like one or two audio tracks and i cut them up and then i started like another thing i love to do is delay so let's say you have a, a vocal line you know like hey baby you know or whatever you take it and you got you 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 cut it and then if you if you put it one stop before or one stop after on another track you get basically a delay effect right of some sort and if you do four or five of those you can start getting really interesting effects with nothing else you know just simple 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 uh mm -hmm. and so I, I started playing around with that and you know and, and this and it's like a really really heavy heavily uh treated vocals but it was great because i treated it like an instrument and actually on the last like jerk is much more experimental than the earlier stuff i did and part of it was just like, let's do songs without really singing because I'm a singer. And so you want to sing too much, right? You always want to like, like, that's one of my problems is I'll have too many, like I have to remove vocals often because I just want to sing over everything. Um, or, you know, you, you focus too much on one thing uh, and to the detriment of other things. And, and for this one, I figured, all right, you know, I'll, I'll experiment around. So one song I did jerk, didn't really have any vocals. It's all sort of spoken word and, you know, this funny thing where I try to pretend I, I try to in my, my voice imitate this, the sound of a computer doing it, da, 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 you know, <laughs> sort of, and it's sort of fun and it works. And then the other one was focused instruction, which was very much this strange uh, vocal effect that became a song. And, and I, I discovered that sort of falsetto. And it, since then, on the new thing, there's a couple of songs where it just it's appeared on its own, like some character in a novel who barges in and does these background vocals or the second vocal line. And yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know about you, but sometimes the creative process, it's surprising. I, I, you know, it's like you, you hear from novelists and the way that characters take over the stories. I've, I've seen that happen with music where the song will take over itself, you know, and, and you're just sort yeah. of, the, you're the vehicle of, of the song coming to fruition, right? You're not in control anymore. Uh, and that I love, I have to say, that's one of the real, it's the spark and why I'm, I continue doing it is for those moments where it's just like, where the heck did that come from? Hmm. You know, it's, or even one of the songs, my, my new single, WTF, What the Fuck, basically. The reason why it's called that is I was fooling around and I came up with this really weird synth line that basically sounds like a theremin. You know, it's like this weird thing. And I, and it just like, I don't know, you're fooling around and you come up with this thing. And I like, what the hell is that thing? It's sort of, and I had this really strange beat that I, 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 you know, you sometimes come up with this really sort of quirky, it's a bit off kilter. And I put the two together and it's like, oh, this sort of sounds interesting. Let's push it. 
And then I started thinking as I had in my mind, it was sort of like, uh, what was the, the Beach Boys song? Uh, Good Vibrations. Because it sort of had that weird, that sort of, you know, that, that theremin line, right? And this sort of reminded me of it a little bit. So I said, well, you know what? I'm going to, let's lean into that kind of thing and, and see where mm. it takes us. And, you know, what came out, came out. Anyway. So well, a, a theremin is just a sine wave, isn't it? That's, that's yeah, the, it, it's the strangest thing, but it, it's 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 an interesting and really early. You could argue it's probably the oldest electronic instrument. Yeah, because yeah, it's, it's literally from the 1940s, I think, 30s or 40s, when the the theremin because mm -hmm. it's named after a guy, right? You know, who invented it? Some some crazy Eastern European inventor. From the Czech Republic, okay. I don't know where he was yeah. from. But, you know. Uh, anyway, we've already been on almost an hour and forty minutes. Um, so I would say let's wrap up with my fi the final question, and I'm really interested to hear your response to it. Mm. And then stay online, and we'll say our our formal goodbyes after after we okay. sign off. So tell me, what was the first? And I know you're old enough because you admitted to it earlier. What was the first piece of vinyl you bought? Uh, yeah, so I, you, I was watching the Moby Tanner interview, so uh, I was thinking as he answered that. I got um, Vienna by Ultravox, so that oh, would have been wow. eight, 81. But I, it was mainly, it, you probably ask any British kid, it was Woolworths vouchers. So they would have been at Christmas, they would have been from my grandmother. So it would have had to have been a single that was in January or February. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, so I got Vienna by Ultravox and also got. Um, rainbow um i surrender i've never really been into sort of mildly soft rock since but um that was what i got yeah but so you you, you went the singles route it wasn't an album for your first yeah i think i probably had uh, the cheapest um record player that you could get the one was sort of like a like a vanity case that you would yep. open up and it would have, it would have had a nail, nail made portable. out of a nail yeah it was one of those so i you know I, I couldn't really start amassing vinyl at that point but. well that no that that's that's fine did, did you ever see uh did you ever see ultravox uh live when they were around no they they um i once had a little chat with him on twitter mid year because okay. i was watching a rerun of top of the pops from their christmas special around about the time of that tr song so it'd have been 81 right. and he was wearing what can only be described as as the the uniform that you would probably have needed to have gone into a lot of the gay clubs at that time so i think he had a he looked like kenny everett basically and kenny everett was a man who um capitalized on that aspect of sexuality so i took the piss out of him on twitter and then Midjour came back and sort of gave me some ribbon back so we, we had a little bit of banter but no i never saw him live no yeah no i i, I was lucky enough i saw them in montreal in the early 80s and okay, I guess it yeah. would have been the tour for the the album that Vienna was on. Uh, they were they were yeah, interesting. Great. Although although I have to say myself, having been like an old sort of electronic head, I was into them in the previous uh, was a J was a John Fox or John Fox uh, iteration before Midger joined the band, right? Yeah, because yeah. he was in what the Rich Kids, wasn't he? I think he was in the Rich I... Kids before. They're, they're actually, I, I find they're quizzing really me on the history of electronic music when I was 10 or younger. So, I'm yeah, well, see, I was, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a couple yeah. years older than you are. Yeah, so, yeah. so, for me, the thing is, I the, the Human League album in 79 was just when I was about 15, 16. So, I was just at that mm. age you were talking about earlier. Mm. And, uh, but and then I, I also worked from when I was like, I guess I was about 17 until I was in my early 20s at a one of the biggest record stores in Montreal where I grew up like the big massive sort of the towers record type thing that had everything. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I had, uh, I had a really good musical education in the sense that, you know, lunch hours you would get sent up to take care of the jazz or the classical section or whatever. And, mm -hmm. you know, and you had the use of the turntable, right? So you, you're, you're, you're yeah. the DJ up there. So you get to listen Perfect. to things. Or, or yeah. like, you know, sort of spoken word or just all kinds of crazy stuff that you wouldn't. And the record the record store I worked for, they really prided themselves in having everything. 
Mm-hmm. So they literally brought in, you know, all kinds of different stuff. So I was exposed to a lot of things. And, and quite frankly, it was a really, it was a really good time to be interested in music because there was so much going on at that yeah, point. It's, it's like the whole sort of place new, the, that, that whole sort of post-punk into, into sort of new wave, into, you know, Joy Division and then Mm. All, all those crazy sort of indie bands uh, at the time, both American and, you know, and European. Because there were some great American bands. And I, I was lucky enough, because I was working at the record store, I got to go go and see a lot of shows, too. So I got to see mm. a lot of really, like, I, I, I saw or- Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark, uh, Simple mm. Minds were great. Yeah, so nice. Like, the early stuff was really, really good. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, saw early REM, um, and just g- goes on and on, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, and mm-hmm. just in the violent femmes, I saw them like when they were touring for their, their big hit record, their one, you know, the, was it a raisin in the sun? Mm-hmm. You, no, I'm, sure, I'm sure you would, if you heard it on the radio, I, I've, I've heard the viol- of violent femmes, but again, I'm not, I'm not. Yeah. Well, they, they were really... the first sort of folk punk. Okay. Like punk attitude, yeah. but acoustic instruments, I guess is the best way to put it. Yeah. But uh, anyway, Joe, real pleasure. We should yeah, do no, this again you, at some point, uh, you know, and uh, thank you for taking the time. It looks like, you know, out of your beautiful day there, it looks like you're having wonderful weather. It's been, the sun's been out. Yeah, it's been lovely. No, nice. Yeah. So so stay on yeah. and we'll, we'll say our proper goodbyes. But uh, thank you so much for your time and thank everyone for watching. Thanks for having me on. Oh, no, again, totally my pleasure.